This week's episode is brought to you by Protect America. Going out of town this summer? Protect what matters most with 24-7 professionally monitored home security from Protect America. The nation's best home security starts at only $19.99 a month. For over 25 years, Protect America has offered award-winning home security with low monthly costs, low upfront costs, and locked-in rates. The other guys can't say that. Visit protectamerica.com slash smart to get $5 off your monthly monitoring. That's protectamerica.com slash smart. And now on to this week's episode. A podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here. Thanks for joining us. And I said it's your curious mind. I wanted to emphasize that this week because I just love, you know, I've been getting some emails. I don't know. I feel like it's picking up and people saying just how some episodes sparked this thought or this business or this change. And I just realized there's people out there just like me and just like John, it's you guys, just hungry to kind of soak some things up and also learn something as you're commuting or walking or running, whatever it is that you do. And it's just fun to connect with you across the microphone. I don't know if I've done enough of that lately. I went back and listened to some old episodes and although they were worse, I think with John and I doing some banter and really kind of connecting with you guys, it was a little bit more fun. So I'm going to tell you a story about our guest this week. That's what I'm going to do. So we get a lot of requests to be on the show. And sometimes we have guests refer other people. And that's what happened this week. So if you remember Todd Cashton, who was introduced to me by Doug Hench, who all those were on the show. Todd Cashton said, hey, a friend of mine, he's great. I think you should have him on. So I briefly looked and I said, wow, he talks about creativity. His books look cool. Well, you know, I'll shoot him an email. So shoot him an email and he says, yeah, why don't we meet up and get some lunch? I'm nearby because he's from near my area. So we do that. And it ended up being about a three hour lunch, I think. Uh, That was maybe supposed to be 45 minutes. A brilliant guy. And I got that sense from him. You know, the kind where you're sitting next to somebody and you're going, all right, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here right now. Uh, But the other thing I really could tell, and I think this is something I've come to acquire and even hone, is my skill of judging someone's intent as well as kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And I could tell that Our guest this week was there really from a point of partnership, from a point of learning and growing and discussing and networking and all the fun things. Well, to wrap up this story, I then go home and do a little more research and come to find out I was a little bit over my head, I think, or underprepared, but maybe that's a good thing. So this week, our guest is Larry Robertson. So Larry is an eight-time award-winning author. He's written two amazing books. We're going to talk much more about them. One is called A Deliberate Pause, Entrepreneurship and Its Moment in Human Progress. And the other is his newest book called The Language of Man, Learning to Speak Creativity. Larry is also the founder of two ventures, one for-profit and one not-for-profit. He's a highly respected thought leader in creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, advising individuals and organizations around the world. Larry is also a graduate of Stanford University and Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, and he's also a former adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at Georgetown University. Now, you hear me read a lot of bios, and yeah, it's great. He's a smart guy, but I think the thing that really caught me off guard is how much of a leader in the field of creativity and entrepreneurship that Larry is. So I can't be more pleased to have him on the show. Somebody that I now call a friend. We connect on email. He's always willing to help and 
throw his ideas in there, which is great from someone like myself who has a million ideas and needs some guidance. Primarily in this episode, we're talking about that thing that Larry has worked on for most of his professional life, which is creativity. And we've covered the subject a lot in many different angles. This one hit me because of how he calls it our language. And when I really think about that, and when I read both his books, which he gave me that at that lunch, I realized how much more important it is to understand creativity. I mean, this podcast was born out of really curiosity and creativity, and it unleashed a part of me that I actually had managed to suppress. I managed to tell myself, no, I'm not creative. I'm the sports guy. You know, I play sports and I'm going to make money because I'm good at things like math or whatever it might be. And it, that was just so far from the truth. So understanding more how we all speak this language, how it is what got us out of the cave and onto the iPhone, you know, all the things in between is creating. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Larry Robertson as we primarily discuss his newest book, The Language of Man, Learning to Speak Creativity. You can follow us at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Sign up for the newsletter in the bottom right-hand corner. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for being curious. Tell a friend if you're enjoying the show. Here it is, our episode with Larry Robertson. Well, Larry, although we've been talking for 40 minutes and the listeners aren't going to be privy to that, I'm so excited to finally hit the record button and have you on. Thanks so much for being on the show. Chris, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, actually, that reminds me, I've had this thought. I've, I've got some kind of pre-recordings of people over the years. I wonder what would happen if I, of course, asked the guests for permission and then released some of that into the universe. Yeah, the, kind of like the bootleg tapes. Yeah, wouldn't that be bizarre? <laughs> anyway. I think it would be really good listening. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. You and I, we we got to know each other. We sat down, had some lunch, and I feel like the podcast is turning in this direction where I'm I'm tr I'm having folks on that I've actually got a chance to meet, yourself included, and it's just such a more rewarding process. You know what I mean? I absolutely do. And you know, it's 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 interesting. You were talking about how we talked a little bit before we started the formal recording of the interview and we'd also had lunch. I I like to think of it as, you know, when you invite listeners into that, it's like they're they've just entered a room and a really interesting conversation is going on. And so it's this combination of you're right there in the thick of it, maybe as it's moving towards its high point or points, uh, but you're also you have this mystery of, you know, what what was said <laughs> before. So I, I kind of like the liveliness of that. That's a good point. Well actually and and to lead into this you know, I was introduced to you by a former guest and I was interviewed, introduced to that former guest by another former guest. Really interesting how that works. But um, and we went to lunch and I knew you'd written books. I loved your topics. I hadn't like dove into your um, your your bio. And and then I did just a couple nights ago. And I said, I actually sent you an email. I said, oh, man, I didn't know I was in the presence of some genius here. So <laughs> here's what I want to do. Here, I'm sure. going to read a brief snippet of your bio. And I want to talk about that because personally, I find it fascinating knowing where people came from and, and why they took that route. So sure. if I just read the last piece, it says, uh, Mr. Robertson, which is funny, and, you know, let's say Larry. <laughs> I think that's my father. <laughs> yeah. Holds a BA uh, with distinction in economics from Stanford, where you are a National Honor Society scholar. Uh, you earn your master's, your your MBA from the Kellogg School, which is, of course, Northwestern. And then um, you that you were a dean's honor roll member there. And then you're a graduate of the Morgan Finance Program of J.P. Morgan. Yeah. When you read that, I mean, the person from the outside is going to go, wow, like really smart, really dedicated, must not have had a life. Tell me about what reality was over that time period. You know, it is so interesting, Chris. I'm sure this is true of many people that I don't even think about those things that that you just read because I I feel like such a different person today than the person who pursued those things and and I guess you could say prioritized those things so uh, growing up 
you know, I, I maybe maybe there's a, a firstborn syndrome piece to this, but I, I was really pushed in a direction to achieve, or at least I thought I was. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we are all so surrounded with order. This is how you do this. This is what you need to know. I'm going to test you in this way on what you know. This is the kind of metric you're going to get to to say whether or not you've learned things properly. And that's a really important side of us. It, it so when when I think about it, that's one of two mindsets that we all have up in our head, and that's the order one, or I call it the hedgehog one. And I'll I'll tell you why in a minute. But there's this other side of our brain called the fox. So the reason I use those terms, fox and hedgehog, they, they're drawn from the single surviving line of a Greek poem several thousands year, years old that said, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows just one big thing. And it has been used over time occasionally to talk about those very different mindsets, one that leans towards order, that would be the hedgehog, that one big thing. How do I do whatever I'm doing right so that I get the National Honor Society scholarship or I get into XYZ school? But then there's this open side to us, which is just as natural. It's just, if you think of it as a muscle, it's one we don't exercise very often, so it tends to atrophy. And what I learned was, even though I thought the forces around me, you know, in particular my, my parents and my grandparents, were encouraging me to achieve in the way that I was trying to achieve, to basically build up that resume, that wasn't what they were teaching me. I had some really innovative parents. My, my dad, in the, if, if I said it in the hedgehog way, is an attorney. Uh, my mother was a, a, an educator. But the way they did what they did was so outside the boundaries of how we typically think about those roles. My dad is a gas, water, and electric rights lawyer in the American Southwest, where you can just imagine that, that those things, uh, water and, and power in particular, are vital to to survival in ways in ways that are even greater than they are in some parts of our country and the dynamic changes all the time for how you deal with those issues even as a lawyer and so his emphasis was always on how do I consider all the parties involved in whatever project I'm working on? How do I look at the totality of how this issue is going to impact them? And even though I represent one side, how can I get a solution that actually does something positive for everybody involved, even as I serve my client? That's a different mentality for how to practice the law. And my mother did the same thing as an educator. She was looking for ways to impact the lives of those she was educating and not just to impact them through the topic that she was teaching. So it took me a while to be able to look backwards at that and say, oh my God, that's the lesson. And to pursue the things I was pursuing with that purpose as the uh, as the lead in or as the forefront thing. And here's one of the things that strikes me, right? If you go through that resume, or even if you look back to some of the things you've done, I know you did investment banking, uh, venture capital. Now you have your consulting firm, but we're going to be talking about two books that you've written that are much more human than those industries can be. And here's mm -hmm. what I'm wondering. Say you had gone to a community college of some sort and you started in, you know, local government or I, I don't know something, but you're the same person, just less either was it opportunity or early drive. Do you think you could get to the same level of recognition or the same enjoyment in what you're doing, reaching this kind of pinnacle or whatever it might be? Um, without that background. That's what I'm yes. really interested in. The answer is yes, and maybe faster. Wow. So it, I think about somebody who, at least the people that I've known, and I've known a lot of people who you mentioned community college, went down the community college path. They don't have to. And the vast majority of people who are in community college are doing something else full-time at the same time. They're working a job, they're raising a family, um, or some combination of those things. So why are they adding the stress of going to college, community college or whatever, on top of that? Because it matters to them. 
and they know why they're doing it. So I think that in some ways, you know, it, it, growing up in the, in the house I did, going to college wasn't an option. It was going to happen. That's just the way the language went in, in, in our household. I knew I was headed there. And in some ways, that's a positive thing because you're, you're looking down the path ahead and you're seeing that your, your formal learning is, is going to continue. I think that's a positive. The downside might be that I didn't take as much time as some of those I've known who went to community college and juggled full lives uh, at the same time in addition to that, I didn't take as much time to think about why am I doing this? Right. And why do I want to go about it this way? So could somebody who went down a different path rise to the same level? Absolutely. Might they do it faster? I think that's possible too. Mm. Might they do it for better reasons right up front? I think absolutely. I really enjoy that answer. And and I think about it in terms of even, I mean, I, I didn't go to community college, but it was by no means a Stanford or anything like that. Um, thought about an MBA, you know, decided, oh, I'll just take a, a high paying job, but fairly quickly realized it wasn't the path for me. And I think, uh, although I feel like I'm old, um, maybe found the direction that I wanted to go and the meaning behind it a little bit earlier. So don't have the same pedigree, but hope to at least get my message out in the same kind of way and reach that you have as well. So I, I get what you're saying there and the, the reasoning why. And I also think that it, it shows now in your books, and we're going to talk about them, uh, the first one, A Deliberate Pause. And the subtitle might throw people off a little bit, Entrepreneurship and Its Moment in Human Progress. But really, that deliberate pause, that moment to stop and think, to think about the why, to think about what's going on, that can relate to what we were talking about is thinking about that early can guide your actions going forward. Absolutely. And it's more, so it's, it's this combination of, yeah, the earlier you are in the habit of pausing, whatever version that means for you, the and earlier that you do that, the more likely you are to tune into those things. But as important, and I would argue even more important, is being in that habit of pausing. Because how you perceive something in any one moment has to change going forward. You know, everything around you is slowly shifting in in a change way, or I would say it, it, it has always slowly shifted. The speed feels like it's it's picking up for, for most things changing around us. But being able to tune in to what's happening around you doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change the path of your life in that moment. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make some big decision to go a different direction. What it means is that you're you're taking notice of what's happening around you, which gives you an opportunity to think about why you do what you do and whether or not the reasons you do it still fit who you are. So that's that's really what this this pause is all about. And and I think as we've talked about before, the way the book got its title, a, a deliberate pause, was that as I was interviewing several hundred people in and around entrepreneurship and asking them about, first of all, what what is entrepreneurship? Because it's a it's like creativity, it's a, a word we use all the time, but we don't usually pause to think about what the hell does that mean? Or in, more importantly, what does it mean to me? And what I found is that as people described how they thought about that word, how they did what they did within entrepreneurship, they were telling me about their own unique pattern of pausing. And so I actually had an interviewee who was telling me about, you know, three or four different adventures he started. And the third time he said, after he, he described a venture that he'd built up and he'd sold or he transitioned out of, and then I took a deliberate pause and he moved on to whatever his description of that wasn't important. I thought, oh my God, that's it. That's what all these people are doing. They're in the pattern of tuning into what's happening around them and why they do what they do. And whatever comes out of that is just more informed. It may not be different, but it's more informed. How do you balance the pausing versus the action? Because sometimes I find I do pause a lot. I am a thinker. And then I just get caught up in this what if. Well, I mean, if you pause long enough, you can find flaws in anything. 
what baffles my mind about entrepreneurs is their ability to pause, think about it, and then say, it's time to break through all of these things that will occur and try to stop me. How do you balance mm -hmm. the two? So it's, it's interesting. When I hear you say the word balance, it makes me think of another reaction that people have to this this idea of pausing and the reaction starts like this yeah i can see how that would be beneficial i don't have any time for that and so it it's it's this thought that pausing is something that is predefined for you rather than something that can occur anywhere let, let me let me give you an example so there's a lot of research out there on luck and that might surprise some people, but there are almost three decades of research looking into why do some people appear to be luckier than others? And one of the foremost experts in this, and I think you've interviewed him, Richard Wiseman, says yeah, it yeah. really boils down to four principles, which if you look at them, they're really habits. So so-called lucky people, the very first thing they do is they are constantly giving themselves more at-bats. And what I mean by that is that rather than just going through their life, you know, their day-to-day -day routine uh, at doing what they always do and never diverting from that, they're looking for opportunities to divert from their normal path in really simple ways. And, and here's the clue for them. They tune into their sense of fit. So every one of us is built, and th there's a lot of science behind this. Every one of us is built in, uh, has built into us what I think of as a sense of fit. We're going through our day, and suddenly something catches our eye, or a thought occurs to us that is out of step with our norm. Could be just a little thing, right? And what we tend to do is smooth over that that sense that something is different here, whether it's something is different and it doesn't seem quite right in a, it doesn't seem quite right in a good way, or something is different here. Hmm, that's curious, but I got to get on with my day. Lucky people tune into their sense of fit enough to notice, why am I noticing that? What is different about it? Uh, does it have any kind of meaning for me? Should I stop two more seconds and explore it? All those thoughts can't take more than five seconds to, to at least ask in your head. So lucky people are constantly tuning into that sense of fit and they're going forward to explore it. And it's the way that they go forward to explore it that makes all the difference. To them, it's play. I could engage in this new opportunity. I could stop and look at that weird looking gum wrapper that I see on the street just because it caught my eye. And it's not so much what I will find. It's the habit I'm putting myself in of, get ready for it, pausing. But as you pause, you're taking notice of something that was spurred in your mind by, hmm, that doesn't look quite right to me. So it's this is a really simple difference in in how people walk these different paths. Most of us, when we we all have that sense of fit. Most of us, when we feel it, we we sense it as noise, and we look to level it out. We look at it as an interference, and some of us look at it as an opportunity to intersect with a whole new idea, a new experience, or a new way of doing things that might take us all of three seconds. Well, you know, and, and here's why that's so beautiful. Recently, I have concluded that one of the things, and this is a conclusion, I mean, partly through interviewing people, but also listening to podcasts. You know, I listen to how I built this and it's all these entrepreneurs. The ability to focus seems like the, the just the critical skill of success and, mm. and success by societal standards. I always want to highlight that because Again, it's money or a company or however you might define it. But focus is something that I tend to lack because of my want to experience new things, get new at bats, see where I fit, mix it up. I kind of often say that for me, my comfort zone is not that comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, how do you differentiate this idea of luck versus focus? You know, wanting to see what's out there, wanting to pause and think and try new things versus picking the time to say, okay, to make this what I want it to be, I actually have to uh, step aside from some of those at-bats. Yeah, well, so I, I would look at that, Chris, and say, you have a very healthy fox brain. <laughs> you you know you know that you are always interested in exploring something new. 
And it's part of the reason that the Smart People podcast is so distinct, is that you guys are willing to go where your interests take you. Okay. So I, I think that sometimes uh, you or others might conclude that you have a lack of focus because you're using somebody else's definition. It's, it's interesting. I was just listening to, to one of your recent podcasts with, with Heather Gray, and she was saying something very similar. You know, this whole idea of, of achievement and why is it that we set these targets for ourselves? Maybe they're the kinds of things you listed in that part of my, my bio, you know, going here, getting this accolade, whatever it might be. Why is it that when we get those things, they don't seem to mean as much as we thought they would? They don't seem to satisfy us. And one of the interesting things she said is that happens because we're so busy using somebody else's definition. So, you know, I think that there's this tendency to say something like, like you said, gee, I don't really think of myself as focused based on whose definition. Because I, I would argue to you that your focus in creating the, the wonderful things that you have, the assets that you've created, that you've shared with others, is exactly what makes you unique. And it's not that you lack the focus to make it orderly. Otherwise, you wouldn't have, uh, you know, what is it, nearly 300 episodes for people to go listen to on a website that's clear and clean and that everybody can access. You can't deliver that if you have no focus. Mm. So I think that it's just a, a different definition of where you're uh, exercising that focus. And I think you're spending a lot of time exercising it in your fox brain. And it turns out that people we look at and say, Oh my gosh, they're you know they're terribly creative or entrepreneurial or even lucky, just happen to spend more time playing with both of their mindsets, the fox and the hedgehog, the open and the order, than the rest of us do. Yeah, and I guess I'll I'll take that because it makes me feel a little bit better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> my work here is done. It is. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, we've talked about a little bit about pausing, and I, I want to go into it more because I think. Okay, the the main thing, the 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 best part of this book, and believe me, there it is. We talked about this. It's deep. It's thoughtful. It's not one of those formulaic books. And we'll talk about the entrepreneurship part, but th this idea of deliberate pause. So I I really want to give you a minute to talk about how do we cultivate that and why is that so important. Sure. Well, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. I, the, the, the simple answer before the story is you have to cultivate it in a way that works for you. And more importantly, as you do it, you have to think of it not as a task. Oh, my God, I have to learn how to pause. But as play. How can I play with this idea of pausing? And in the process, find a way that works for me. So here's th the story. One of the people I interviewed for a deliberate pause is a gentleman by the name of Richard Tate. And Richard spent somewhere between 10 and a dozen years at Microsoft. And his primary job was starting new businesses for Microsoft. So uh, one of the most successful ones, and he had several of them, was Expedia, which is still one of the top travel sites around today. He left Microsoft because he just had this idea that didn't fit within Microsoft that he wanted to make real. And, and it became a company that you might be familiar with called Cranium. Oh, yeah, and Cranium yeah. reinvented and revitalized the board game market. So the board game portion of toy companies that owned, you know, Monopoly, Sorry, whatever it might be, was flat to declining for over a decade and a half when Richard came into this market. But he saw board games as this really unique opportunity for humans, not just for kids, but for adults too, to be this combination of tactile, uh, orderly and competitive as you try to be the winner of the game, to um, be creative as you go, to not just follow a set of rules, but have those rules modify as you play the game. So it was a terrific idea. It was one heck of a hard hike to get to the point where he convinced Starbucks to offer these games in the Starbucks store, which again, was a very distinct way of looking at what he was trying to do rather than buying a game online or buying a game in a toy store. So let me give you Richard's version of a deliberate pause. It was how he went to lunch every day. 
And what Richard told me is that every day he left his normal space in his office at Cranium to go out to lunch, even if it was 10 minutes to go get a sandwich at the deli and come back. He always took himself out of the office. That right there is a form of pausing. But then he did two additional things. The first one was any time he went out to lunch, he would walk a different direction. So what I mean by that is if he went around the block to the left yesterday to get to the deli, today he might go around it to the right. Or if it was a straight line shot, he might walk himself forward 20 steps and then take 10 steps backwards and then continue forward. Just some little alteration physically in what he did, he believed created a shift in his mind, not on any particular day, but by doing it every day. And the second thing he told me he always did was he talked to somebody. So if he bumped into somebody he knew, he tried to talk to them about something different, something unexpected, or to talk to them in a new way. Or he would talk to a complete stranger. So the the example I always give is pretend you're standing in line at that deli. It's a long line. And the woman in front of you says, gee, this line sure is long today. And typically we would say, yep, Richard would engage that person and start to talk to them about anything. And so if you can take something as simple as going to lunch or the way you walk or the way you stand around others and decide to engage them, his belief was he would always come back to his office looking at things in a different way. Dramatically different? Not necessarily. But that habit always shifted his thinking. And the more he did that as a habit the more likely he was to have breakthrough ideas or creative ideas that that he wanted to have to move that company forward. So to me, this is this example of it is not hard. It's very personal. It can happen. This is creating that pattern of a deliberate pause. It can happen in the routine that you already have, and you should have fun with it. How did you come to this idea? I mean, I know you interviewed a lot of people through, you know, various interactions you had. But what was it about this pause that jumped out? There's a woman I interviewed for the the second book, the most recent book, The Language of Man. Her, her name is Deborah Meyer. And Deborah is an education reformer, which means when schools or school districts are troubled, she's one of the people who comes in and helps to revamp them top to bottom. Uh, in very creative ways, sometimes in very controversial ways because she does it so differently. She also helps build new schools. Deborah and her teams practice what they call the five habits of the mind. And the five habits are these five questions that they always ask themselves. And this goes directly to, you know, how did I come upon this, this deliberate pause thing? Or how did I conclude that it was so important and and needed to be a focal point. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but I was following Deborah's five habits of the mind. The first habit or the first question of hers is, how do I know what I know? And they ask themselves that as a way to gut check, where am I getting my assumptions from? So in that first book, A Deliberate Pause, it was about entrepreneurship. And the whole point of going down that path of writing a book was to ask that question, how do we know what we know? We use this term all the time, and yet I had people coming up to me whenever I would speak publicly, a room full of people who who associated themselves with the label entrepreneur, and they would pull me aside. They would look around to make sure nobody was listening, and they would ask some form of the question, what is entrepreneurship? So here they are doing this thing, using this label, and yet they're not sure exactly how they know what they know and what the meaning of this term is. So as I was do- using Debert's first habit of the mind of, of asking, how do I know what we know? I came to her second habit, which is, is there a pattern? Because sometimes when we look at what we know, we get anecdotal information. We, it's one isolated situation that tells us we ought to look at things differently or that confirms the way we have been looking at things. But when we see a pattern of something occurring, it's usually indicating something important to us. So what I saw was this pattern of people taking what I came to think of as a deliberate pause. I didn't know such a term. 
in most cases, they didn't use such a term, but that's exactly what they were doing. They were pausing in some way that was their own and doing it deliberately to basically ask, how do we know what we know? And when they did that, they were leading to that third, Deborah's third habit of the mind, which was, what if? So she goes from, how do we know what we know, to is there a pattern, to what if we fill in the blank from there. What if we did things differently? What if we approach the problem in a different way? What if we completely abandoned X and went towards Y? And so as I was exploring these entrepreneurs, seeing that they were taking a deliberate pause, I was noticing that their what if moments were occurring in those pauses or quickly after them. And when they built that habit for a whole culture around their venture, that venture tended to have more ideas and better ideas over time. And they tended to continue to have them, not to have one, build a company around it and stop there, but to really have this culture of constantly innovating. So I won't continue down the path of Deborah's habits, but really that's what I was doing and that's what I was observing others were doing. And that's how I came to focus on that pattern of a deliberate pause. Mm. You know, and one of the things I found interesting is tying this idea of a deliberate, a, a deliberate pause to entrepreneurship initially seems like, okay, we're just trying to solve another business issue or tell people how to become entrepreneurs. But when you get into the book, it's actually, you talk more about entrepreneurship being a, a mindset, a way of living and a good thing overall, which I got to be honest, I'm just sick of hearing the damn word. I'm I'm just <laughs> sick of it. I'm sick of the word. I'm sick of seeing it on magazine covers. I'm sick of the top 20 under 30. I'm, I'm all of it is I'm done. And so reading your book though, was like, let's talk about entrepreneurship for what it is. It's being human and creating new things in a, in a very almost altruistic way. Mm-hmm. So tell me two things. First, why is entrepreneurship good? Like why, how can you put a good spin on it? We'll, we'll just start there actually. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll point you to the title and subtitle. Notice that the title of that book, a deliberate pause doesn't have the word entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. in the main title. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the subtitle, by the way, if you if you were to look at the cover of the book, you'll see the subtitle in also very small print says entrepreneurship and its moment in human progress. So I know of no one else who uh, is writing about entrepreneurship or has written a book about entrepreneurship that uses the phrase human progress in the same sentence. But really that mindset to want to create something new to want to create something valuable and to want to share it with others and actually have impact is built into us. That is how we progress. And again, I'll point you to the the wording in that subtitle, entrepreneurship and its moment in human progress. This isn't about pausing in one particular moment, just as it isn't about the moment when you create the first iPhone, or it isn't about the moment when you create Apple right? Or even the moment when Steve Jobs is leading Apple. Moment has multiple meanings, and one is to move forward, like momentum. So the idea here is that it's this mindset of constantly thinking about why are things the way they are and how might they be better that leads to our ongoing progress. That's the mindset I'm talking about. And the best entrepreneurs by the definition of the ones who have the most impact and the ones who get beyond the one syndrome, the O-N-E in quotes, one idea, one person with the ideas, one person leading the venture, one venture, one moment in time. That is, as much as we look at those metrics as metrics of success, wow, look at what Steve Jobs created with Apple. If we can't move beyond that, then we're really not going to progress long term. The the idea of the most successful entrepreneurship is that it has lasting value, which means that it has to move beyond one. When you start to spread it to a larger culture, when you start to to spread it beyond you know the culture of your organization or whatever its mission is, when you step the hell out of the way and let other people bring the ideas. 
that's really that entrepreneurial mindset that I'm talking about. So I, I get sick of seeing the word in headlines too, primarily because I know that there's no thought about the use of the word or the use assumes certain stereotypes about entrepreneurs that just simply aren't true. This the larger mindset of wanting to have this lasting impact is what I'm talking about. How would you say, or what is the difference between, yeah, let's go with that. What is the difference between an entrepreneur and a creative or just somebody who creates? That's a really, really great question. So I look at creativity as being the deeper root or the deeper catalyzing seed. Because what creativity is really talking about is a capacity that we are all built for, that we've all evolved to have that, that capacity and that need to want to think about the future. This is a, this is a really interesting um, concept and quote I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. There was a, a book written probably about five years ago called Stumbling Stumbling on happiness. Yep, oh, stumbling on happiness. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and Dan Gilbert was was the author. And Dan pointed out that human beings are the only species that we know of that think about the future. So literally, we have this not just this ability, but this need to think about what could be. And more than that, we have a drive within each one of us to to want to contribute to that. So I'll, I'll refer to another book. I, I, I'm assuming you're somewhat familiar with the author, uh, Dan Pink, and one of his books was called Drive. Oh, yeah. We had Dan and, on. Okay, great. Yeah. So I, I didn't hear that particular episode, but your listeners oh, a while will, ago. <laughs> will, will know his his book and, and Drive, and I'll, I'll remind them of the concept. And that is, what is it that really drives us? And one of the things Dan points out brilliantly is that there is 40, almost 50 years of research that says the things that we think drive us, the things that companies use to motivate us and incent us, the things that schools use to do that aren't the things that motivate us. So rather than the money or the grade, the things that motivate us are things like mastery, really becoming skillful in something that, that comes from within you, that you do, uh, purpose directing that mastery towards something, impact, having some kind of impact on others, whether we know it directly or we know it indirectly, those are the very things that motivate us. And so when we lean towards those, we not only feel more fulfilled, we're actually starting to tap our creative capacity. Because we're looking at what could be, what can I master, what purpose can I follow, what impact can I have that's in the future. That, to me, is creativity. Your question was, what's the difference between that and entrepreneurship? Actually, the mindset is very similar. But the entrepreneur is going on to, to, to try to create a... Uh, we, we tend to think of it as, as an organization, whether that's for-profit or non, and to try to have some larger value out of it. It's just one application of our creative capacity to go down that entrepreneurial path. It's not the only one. So for me, the creativity goes deeper, but successful entrepreneurship is fully tied to tapping that creative side of us as well as tapping that hedgehog side of us that delivers something tangible and, and valuable. Yeah, it's just one of those things. You know, when you look at this entrepreneurship and then the ability to uh, sink into it, use that creativity. And we're going to talk more about creativity because your second book is just, again, it's taking this topic that we've talked about and making it so human. But I wanted to really hone in on this entrepreneurial idea here and how that is creative. Because another thing you talk about is redefining business to some extent, redefining, you know, you, you talk about a story, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but how he, he was a venture capitalist and he invested in a lot of entrepreneurs. And although they would come to him with a plan and it was important, he was mm -hmm. more interested in how are you going to um, execute and be flexible when things don't go their way. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering is, Kind of how does the um, the business plan, the planning, the execution part, 
how does that intertwine with and where, I guess, why did that come into the idea of a deliberate pause? Yeah. So the, um, think about that venture capitalist or anybody who's going to support you if you're an entrepreneur who has an idea. What What is the first thing they typically ask for? Do you have a business plan? Now, why do they ask for that? I say there are several reasons. One, that's that's what they're told they should ask for, right? That's just kind of the the best practices habit that's been formed. But the second thing is, is that they want to see a tangible that shows you've actually thought about the idea that you're pursuing. It doesn't mean that when they read that plan, they're going to agree with you. And in fact, the best venture capitalists know that the majority of what exists in a, in a plan at any particular point in time is going to turn out to be irrelevant, uh, bullshit, uh, not as necessary towards achieving some kind of lasting impact as other things. So when I wrote that story, what I was talking about was that the the, the best venture capitalists, the best um, service providers who support entrepreneurs know that ideas come and go, that big ideas are really an accumulation of smaller ideas, one added to the other, one tossed aside, another one modified. And so the temperament to to have the openness to to explore those ideas in the first place, to tune into that sense of fit we were talking about and to play with it, but also the resilience to be willing to let go of an idea that isn't working, to even recognize that it's not working, or to have to come up with a new one when it feels like you just bet everything on the one that's turned sour, mm. turns out to be far more important than what that original idea is. So I'm not trying to, in saying that, I'm not trying to discount the idea or discount the business that you're developing a plan around. And I'm certainly not discounting the idea of planning. But planning is just thinking. Planning is thinking through the problem and trying to think about not only all the opportunities ahead of you, but all the stuff that might pop up and bite you in the ass. And it's that thinking process that anybody who backs you is looking for. They're looking to see that you've gone through it and that you're in the habit of continuing to go through it. Why is that? Not just because the process requires it, but because if you are fit in uh, in using that process, in pausing deliberately, in thinking about what if and, and all those things, and seeing things in advance, you raise the odds that their investment in you is going to be more successful. It's not a guarantee, but it is an absolute raising of the odds. So I think sometimes, you know, so this is something I talk about in, in the language of man. We tend to look at creativity from the wrong end. We tend to look at it through the output. Oh my God, look at that incredible painting that Picasso painted. And then we judge creativity in painting through a filter that could only be Picasso's. So we rarely go back to the front end and say, what led him down that path? What led him to explore the idea of representing forms in geometric shapes versus as we, how we tend to perceive them in, in what we think of as, as our reality. So it's really going back to those roots and, and saying, what is it about creativity that leads not just one person, Picasso, Steve Jobs, whoever it might be, down this path? What's common to all of them? What are the patterns around it? And the same thing is true in entrepreneurship. There are certain patterns about how people approach an idea, approach a business, even approach a business plan that lead to higher odds of success and greater resilience than others. And one of those key things is you're not fixated on your plan or your idea, but you have some flexibility. You believe in it and you think it's the right path, but you're also quite aware that as you try to implement it, things are going to change and you have the resilience to go with that and flex to the opportunity. You know, what's really interesting there is, as you mentioned, kind of there are some patterns or that is one pattern in entrepreneurship. The, the really resounding message of uh, a deliberate pause as it relates to entrepreneurship is that there is not a prescription for it. And there's a line that you say somewhere is, you know, we believe the story of the individual entrepreneur tells the story of entrepreneurship, but it mm -hmm. doesn't even come close. 
So how, what do you mean by that? And then how do we differentiate that idea from the fact that there are still some patterns? Right. So we love hero tales. Um, culturally, it, we love hero tales, but human beings have loved that. It's, it's been our, it's been our go-to story across cultures for wow, thousands of years. I may be going back further than, than we even know. So we like to tell the, the story of the Horatio Alger story of, you know, rising from rags to riches, or we like to think that, that Bill Gates, for instance, has had nothing but success because it's interesting to think about it that way. However, when you look at the story of a, of a, a, a Bill Gates and you then use that as your formula or your interpretation of what's the right path to take through entrepreneurship, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself because it leaves out his ups and downs. It leaves out his faults and follies. It leaves out critical parts of the story and the fact that that entrepreneurial story is a constant cycling. So I think it's when we when we confuse the two, when we confuse the the my stories, I think of it. This is how it went for me. Uh, as an interpretation or as a as a as a playbook to entrepreneurship that we get off track. That's that's what I think the real difference is. Ultimately, we're talking about human beings here, and every one of us is different. So you can look at the patterns across entrepreneurship and what what tends to lead to successful entrepreneurship. But when you do that, you'll also um, you'll you'll be looking at the you'll see those patterns are a, are a generality rather than a specific, you know, here, here's what Bill Gates did. I, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. And I think it's the reason I really wanted to make sure we got that in is I think it's a critical piece of information for anyone who's interested in being an entrepreneur or feels drawn to it or even likes the word perhaps, because again, out of all the people I've interviewed and, and even more so listening to these podcasts of other entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. the, the contradictions are almost, um, immeasurable. They're everywhere. I mean, you could take the two biggest companies in the world, interview the founders and learn that they went about it completely different ways. That's right. It's, it's unbelievable. I remember listening to one uh, back to back, these two podcasts, one entrepreneur says, you know, um, in the question regarding luck says, oh, you can't build a company without luck. If it wasn't this timing, this, that, this, that, we wouldn't have one. The very next one, company of almost similar size says, I don't believe in luck. I created my outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if you listen to one in a vacuum, you are you you could be potentially on the wrong path entirely. That's correct. So that's absolutely correct. But you can, so let's let's look at a let's get specific here and let's you know we're 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 talking about specifics here, but I'm I keep emphasizing that there are patterns across entrepreneurship that can be followed. Okay, and 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 customized to your particular situation. That's that's pretty important here. Here's one. No entrepreneur and no entrepreneurial venture ever goes it alone. They're part of an ecosystem. So that's different than just saying, uh, I have employees, I have partners, uh, I have customers. It's saying that, that you have to have some consciousness about how your business is interconnected with your community, how your business is interconnected with other businesses, sometimes your competitors, sometimes businesses that seem completely unrelated to yours, that there's both a visible connection to things, that that would be the more obvious uh, customers, partners, and employees and such, and there's an invisible part. I, I talk about this idea in a deliberate pause of the Aspen effect. Um, what that means is that if, if you know, your listeners are familiar with aspen trees, they're, they're these very uh, thin trunked white trees with these gorgeous quaking uh, green leaves or in the fall gold leaves. And when you see an aspen stand, it appears to be dozens, if not hundreds of individual trees when actually they're all one organism. So they're all connected underneath. They all share the same root system. They all share the uh, nutrients that are around transferring it across the entire system from what looks like individual tree to individual tree. They protect 
one another from the elements, from wind and from blowing down and things like that, because they are interconnected. But when we look at an aspen stand, all we see are those individual trees on the surface, just like we see individual companies or individual entrepreneurs. But there are these connections underneath as well as on the surface that exist. And knowing that, knowing that pattern, knowing that the most successful entrepreneurs are looking for those connections, recognizing them and cultivating them is a pattern you can follow that raises the odds you will be successful in whatever you are pursuing. Mm -hmm. How you do that is going to differ entrepreneur to entrepreneur, venture to venture, moment in time to moment in time. So I just give that as one example of, look, there are these patterns there. Those are the important things. And then you have to make them your own. Right. Well, and we've been dancing between kind of, and there are these similarities between both of your books, because it's, I would imagine if I said, how would you define what you do? It would be a mixture of both of these. But I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the newest one, uh, the language of man learning to speak creativity, which came out. When did this officially drop? Yeah, it it came out in late September this last fall. Okay, so, so pretty pretty new. Six months. Yeah, yeah. not not straight uh, straight off the presses, but pretty new. Already receiving all kinds of recognition, which kind of blows my mind. Like I don't know how you win all these awards. I didn't even know they had that many awards, but <laughs> you do somehow. So congratulations with that. Thank you. But um, let's start with this idea of it being a language. I feel like it's never talked about that way, even though we might internalize it that way. Why is creativity a language and why is it our most basic and, and grounded language? Sure. So language, it, no matter what kind of language we're talking about, whether it's spoken language and, and there are thousands of spoken languages, believe it or not, or it's language through sign, like what you do with your hands or your facial expressions or sound, or it's written format, whatever it is, it's about expression. And what you are trying to do is take the basic components of the language and come up with expression and meaning that is A, unique to yourself, and B, has meaning to somebody else. It can have impact on them. So when I talk about creativity as a language, I'm talking about it both literally and metaphorically. The idea here is that if you can understand certain basics of creativity no matter where it occurs. So it's independent of field and form and time and even creator. If you can understand what those, here we go again, patterns are across creativity, you're basically learning the components of a language. So what I do is in the book is I actually identify, I call them elements of the language. And sometimes it's a word like openness. And the idea is to cue you into this critical aspect of all creativity, this, this habit and pattern and willingness to be open. Um, sometimes it's a word. Sometimes it's a what I, what I think of as a simple truth. So a, a simple truth is in the book, one of the simple truths is creativity seeks perpetuity. And what I mean by that is creativity is ongoing. You don't create something and, and then stop. So if you take these words that act as cues, if you take these patterns across creativity, if you take these things that I refer to as simple truths, what you basically have are elements of a language. And any time you go about creating, they serve as reference points for you to frame how you're creating in that moment in time, which might change later. So you're kind of, if you, if you can think of it this way, it's almost like Legos and you're putting the pieces together as they suit your needs in that particular moment in time and what you're trying to do. We don't think about creativity that way. Instead, we think about what tricks or techniques can I find that will make me creative? And it's not to say that there aren't exercises or te techniques out there that let you play with your creative capacity. But to really understand creativity, you have to understand that there is a language behind it. There are these patterns. There are these similarities. And then you have to treat it like a language and make it your own. 
and combine it in the ways that that let you express your unique capacity for it. So that's what I mean by a language. I believe it is literal. I believe it passes the test of being a language, and I explore that in the book. But the metaphorical view of it is even more powerful, that you can take these components, these elements of creativity, and you can express some meaning and and uh, ex expression that's unique to you. That's really what it's all about. And understanding that is really coming to understand creativity. Well, and you know, at first, and that makes sense. I agree. I, you know, I understand this idea of a language, but at first I said, okay, um, so why does it necessarily pertain to me or, or, you know, do I need to kind of dive in? I know I'm creative. Do I need to hone this language? But then you, really early on, you talk about um, the simple truths. And I think that opened my eyes a little bit to how some people uh, outwardly appear or actually are more creative, even mm -hmm. though we all kind of evolved to have this creativity. Could you talk about those simple truths? Sure. Well, I'll let's focus in on the, the initial ones in, in particular. So one of the things, as you know, I describe in the, the book is I, I ask my readers to create a picture, either to, you know, get a pencil and paper and draw it or to create it in their head. And it's a simple picture. It's a pie. And the pie has a very thin slice cut out of it. And if you were to identify that slice with the letter A, you would say A is all those people who know that they're creative. And it's a very thin slice. And that's how we tend to look at creativity, that there are some exceptional few geniuses amongst us. They won the genetic lottery pool or something. They have some X factor that makes us different than the, the rest of us. And the rest of us are that remaining pie. But if you were to label that remaining pie, it I would label it to say those who have been wrongly told they're not creative. So the first simple truth that distinguishes so-called creative geniuses from the rest of us is that they know that we're all creative and they practice using their capacity for it. That is the only difference there. So for the book, one of the things I did besides a lot of um, other research was to interview MacArthur fellows and MacArthur fellows are given the MacArthur fellowship, which is for creativity and much to their dismay has come to be known as the genius award or the genius grant. You can't apply for it. It's just bestowed upon you. And the idea is that others have seen this pattern in your thinking, not what you've accomplished, but where your thinking might take you that is worth honoring as having been creative. And when it comes right down to it, those MacArthur fellows, the very first thing they would say to me, and I didn't know any, any of them except one person before I interviewed them, and I interviewed nearly 70. The very first thing they wanted to start the conversations with was, if you want to talk about genius, I'm out. Because mm -hmm. there's no such thing. It doesn't work that way. And they were saying, each in their own way, the only difference between you and me is I know we're all creative and I'm playing with my capacity for it. That's it. That's the, and they came from, I interviewed people in their 20s all the way up to their late 80s. I interviewed people who had grown up all across the country and indeed all across the world in every conceivable field, split by gender, male, female. It was all over the board. They had came from different educational backgrounds, different economic backgrounds. There's no X factor out there except that knowledge that we have this capacity and the practice of using it. That's it. So that's one of the most important simple truths is to know that you have this capacity. The other simple truths come out of that. Uh, and it's really about following the patterns of, of play when people use their creativity and act, act actually create something of value. What are those patterns and what simple truths do they lead to? But I'll, I'll stop right there with those, those as the most important ones, uh, that knowledge that we all have this capacity and playing with it. Yeah. And those are the ones that I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that those are the ones I'm referring to. And the story about the MacArthur Fellows, I think, is so powerful because when w that's what it was to me. You 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 talk about that right up front in the book, and I know that. I mean, I actually know the brain science about how and why we're able to be creative, 
And I feel like that's such a unique attribute of being human Mm -hmm. that once you say, okay, it's part of us biologically, evolutionarily, then how do I utilize it in a way that's enjoyable? And um, one of the things you talk about, beneficial, not only for ourselves, but for others. Sure. And one of the things that strikes me is this idea of almost altruism is pervasive in your work. It's, you know, uh, creativity, even entrepreneurship being done for others, for humanity. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe we are kind of inherently good and want to do things for others and for our species? Because the evidence is so thick that that's exactly why we do things. I mean, you you could look at archaeological evidence and, and, and you could see the trend line to human beings coming together in groups to survive, to, to benefit one another long before our fox brain really developed. When we just had that hedgehog survival uh, mindset, we found that we survived better as groups. But you can flash forward all the way to um, current stories and and some of the most interesting ones are related to survival. There's this there's this fascinating book called Adrift and it's written by a guy named Stephen Callahan and Stephen Callahan was looking to solo sail across the Atlantic and something happened within the the first nights of his journey where something hit his boat, his little sailboat, and basically destroyed it. And he had to piece together this raft out of the parts that he could find. And he survived, I I think it's still one of the longest, if not the longest, uh, uh, links of survival of any individual out there, 71 or 72 days adrift at sea. And when these fishermen uh, finally saw him when he drifted towards the the South American coast, and they were looking to pick him up. Here he had been adrift all this time at sea. Here he's about to be rescued. And what was the most important thing for him to do? To point out to the fishermen in broken language communication between them because they didn't speak English and he didn't speak their language, that he had just seen this huge school of fish and they needed to go after it. So all he asked them to do was throw him a bottle of water and they literally went out and fished for two hours before they came back and picked him up. He'd been adrift for all these days. When when different writers like Lawrence Gonzalez and others have explored this with him, why was that? He said it was because I needed to survive for others, not necessarily specific family members. I needed to show that this could be done because that's what's important to the species, to show that we are capable of far more than we think they're, we're capable of, whether it's survival or it's creating value. And that the most important thing to do is to do that, not just because it's important for us individually to answer our own version of what does it mean to be human, because it's in pursuing that and in exemplifying that that the human race continues. And I know that sounds lofty. I don't think of it as altruistic as much as I think of it as going to our genes and how we're built and how we have evolved. And it turns out that the result of that can be this wonderful combination of things that are really valuable in the way we tend to think about them through the measure of, say, uh, financial value. Or they can be what I I tend to associate with the altruistic thing, having done good by the environment, by uh, other people, by you know our, our immediate society or something like that. But they all go back to this root of leaning towards what it means to be human and trying to figure out our version for that. And ultimately, that involves other people. Mm. And that's really what this is all about. So um, people have looked at a deliberate pause and they've said, wow, you sure interviewed a lot of nonprofits in here. I don't think of them as entrepreneurial, (laughs) which I always laugh at because (laughs) they're doing more with less under more challenging conditions in most cases than than most for-profits are are doing. But the, the point is, is that a deliberate pause, just because it represents that form of entrepreneurship, isn't saying, hey, you know, we need to have mo- more socially oriented ventures. Maybe we do. But what we really need to do is understand entrepreneurship and why 
people do it and what that mindset is and that it is about creating value in this larger sense. And lo and behold, it turns out it naturally includes those things that we tend to categorize as a social value versus a financial value. Mm. It includes that larger spectrum. And those entrepreneurs that get that, whether you want to call it triple bottom line or they just are calculating that in whatever version of value they're creating, tend to last longer and they tend to spread the opportunity for others to create value as well. Yeah, actually, I, oh man, how the name is blanking me, but we interviewed, um, I interviewed just a couple of days ago, uh, a woman, she's an economist and she's talking about how do we redo economics? How do we talk about the fact that no longer, uh, the, the system we've created is no longer serving us and we need to kind of raise the bar away from this growth mentality and more to this mentality of, you know, transparency and um, communication and, you know, giving value in multiple different ways. Um, It it hasn't aired yet. So I don't know which one will come first, but there's a nice tie there. And it just made me think of it. The last thing I want to- There's a pattern, Chris. There's a pattern, isn't there? Oh yeah. I mean, because we're talking about this this woman that you interviewed and that the the, uh, the podcast is yet to post. I was talking earlier about Heather Gray, mm-hmm. and and her saying, "Look, success starts with figuring out what your definition of it is." and how you want to go about it and how you're going to calculate it. Not too long ago, you interviewed another woman, Leanne Jacobs, about how to achieve real wealth. And what is she talking about? She's talking about this more expansive definition of value, and she's talking about creating it or uh, even choosing what you decide to invest in, where you decide to make your sacrifices based on more people than you. And that that's how how real wealth is is created. So, you know, I think that there's no coincidence that this larger frame of thinking about these things is what makes the difference, whether we're talking about uh, creating real wealth, we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're talking about creativity, or as, as Heather said, we're talking about how do you stop compromising and still have it all? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because... I think that either these subjects are self-selecting or, and what I really hope is, it's just, it's our next evolution towards these things. And and by the way, the the name of the woman is Kate Rayworth, and she wrote a book called Donut Economics. So A, if you're listening, keep an eye out for that. But B, just for you, Larry, um, it'd be interesting to look into her. Yeah, I appreciate that. But last thing, I I know we're running out of time here, but I wanted to kind of leave as a teaser for this book, The Language of Man. What did you uncover? What's the main kind of concise point that the way MacArthur Fellows access creativity differently from the rest of us and how we can utilize that to help in our own creative endeavors? Yeah. I know. It's well, like, hey, how do you condense I, the entire book into one you know, thing? But right. Well, it's kind of like one of your favorites. Yeah. You're, I mean, it, it's it's like being in the candy store and you even say, OK, just from this counter and this <laughs> shelf on this counter, can you just pick one thing? But yeah. let me give you. And that that really ties this all together and, and loops back to what we talked about before. And, and I'll, I'll give you it by telling you how I did interviews. So when I interviewed these MacArthur fellows, I had a, some general subject matter that I wanted to discuss, but I let the interviews go wherever they were going to go. One question I did ask everybody at the end was this, what did we not talk about or what did I not ask you that should come up in a topic like this? And very early on in these interviews, I was interviewing a gentleman named Pedro Sanchez, and I asked him that question, what did I did not ask you that we, I should have asked you or that we should have talked about? And he said to me, what do you do for fun? And I said, oh, well, you know, I have young kids and I, I coach their sports teams and I love that. I'm a big kayaker. I love to hike and I'm going through my list. And he says, no, what do you do for fun? That's the question you didn't ask me. And what it revealed was something I knew but was so easy to put aside, that fun and play as you pursue these far more challenging things of should I attend community college while I have a full-time job or not? Should I pursue this particular goal, start this venture or not? Really comes down to not just knowing yourself and what your priorities are. But where can you find fun in your approach to doing it? You're going to do the work anyway. 
you're going to enter into the uncertainties anyway. If you can find a way to be playful about how you do it, not to lack seriousness, but to be playful about how you do it, it yields better results. And that's what Pedro was trying to tell me. And that's what I never failed to ask after uh, Pedro made that comment to me. So if I had to pick one thing, it's what do you do for fun? How can you find that fun in whatever you're doing? I love it. And that's the where that's where I want to keep it. Because if if you're not enjoying it, if we're not having fun, if we're not accessing the creativity in a way that we enjoy, we actually stifle creativity. It's just part of the way the brain works. We cannot be kind of fearful and worried and creative at the same time. It doesn't happen. Absolutely true. So, wow, it was a long time. Larry, I appreciate all your time. I mean, we, we've been talking now for quite some time and we had uh, we were recording for about half of it. So I really appreciate it. I know you're busy uh, getting these books out there, getting your message out to the world and in the process winning awards. Um, we've talked about two, your, both of your books, A Deliberate Pause entrepreneurship and its moment in human progress and the language of man learning to speak creativity. Uh, for those first, I'd say go pick up the books. We'll link to them on smart people podcast, or you can get them anywhere. Um, dive in. But for those that want more from you or, uh, just want to follow along, you know, where are you these days? Are you writing? Are you tweeting? Are you Facebooking or what's going on with you? Sure. I'll give you two quick answers in there and their two websites. So I have kind of this three page, uh, you might call it a hub website, LarryRobertson.me. And it will show you uh, a full range of things I'm doing, whether it's writing or business or, or something else. But I'd also suggest that if this particular topic interests listeners, that they go to languageofman.com and look under the honors tab because they're going to find podcasts like this and other interviews and and uh, uh, links that I think are going to be interesting to them. So those would be the primary things. I've also just recently become a columnist for the Creativity Post. So that might be a third place you could look for me. Perfect. Well, again, Larry, it has been a great time. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for taking the time to share your message. And uh I look forward to, to talking with you more in the future. Chris, what you do is important. I love your focus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, because sometimes <laughs> I do not like my lack of focus, but I, I see it in a new light. Well, I'm glad to be a part of it. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Larry Robertson. Larry's books, A Deliberate Pause, Entrepreneurship, and Its Moment in Human Progress, and The Language of Man, Learning to Speak Creativity, can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And if you decide to purchase through Amazon, please do not forget to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. All purchases that you make through that link come at no extra cost to you and it greatly helps out the show. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, you can always head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review over there. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. As always, you can find all things Smart People Podcast over at the website smartpeoplepodcast.com and you can sign up for the newsletter there. Again, we promise no spam and just an occasional newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. We've got some awesome interviews coming up and we will see you all next episode.